and welcome to the Rock and Roll to Success. Today I have Alistair Chegwiden, better known as Mr. Cheggs. Cheggs, <laughs> a basketball aficionado and soon to be a SAS mogul. What's up, Cheggs? Uh, not too much, mate. Just uh, chipping away at the office here. It's uh, yeah, 8.30 p.m. here in Western Australia, mate, so we're just kicking back. Um, booked in a couple of calls and podcasts this week, so I'm looking forward to it, dude. Yeah, man, it's an honor to have you. Last time we recorded, unfortunately, the great internet from Western Australia didn't help us too much, but I hope that this time we have a better recording. Yeah, let me down. It's been well known, Dave and the boys that I do spaces with on on X, Twitter, uh, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, like to give me some grief about... About two hours into our spaces, my uh, Wi-Fi likes to uh, cut out, and uh, that did it last time when we did our podcast. So um, I'm fingers crossed, and hopefully it uh, holds on for us today. And man, when did you realize the importance of having a personal brand and of being on social media? And also, you have Amplify X that helps people build up their own brands. So when did you get that spark of inspiration? Oh, man, I I was like so many people. I was sitting there um, consuming content for a long time and I went to start and even started a few times the last four or five years. And technically, since I've been a professional teacher, they're very strict on having um, social media presence and I used that as a bit of an excuse for a long time. Um, I realized um, a few years ago that there was a shift between company branding to personal branding and you had the rise of, you know, your Dan Coes and even like your podcast stuff. Like I really loved listening to like obviously your big podcasts, um, your Joe Rogans and that. And they were just able to talk about whatever they wanted post whatever they want whenever they post it and I've been writing for years I don't know how long I have I still have content now that I can post that I've not posted before um I'm old school I've been writing in my iPhone notes and in Google Docs for over 10 years so I've got heaps of stories heaps of content and I thought well if I put my um handle as Mr. Cheggs on X you know it can be seen as educational and I don't swear or um, troll or post any graphic videos. It's, you know, my own thoughts, um, my own business, my own philosophies, um, how I've grown. Um, I think I've been been posting consistently coming up a year, um, and it's all organic, um, no paid. It's been a bit of a grind, but, yeah, I've gone zero to 1,800 on, on X and – and that's just been not following other people. That's just been posting and commenting and engaging, running spaces. And then on LinkedIn, um, I've probably got 13, 1,400 followers and connections there just from same thing, posting, commenting, um, engaging. But, yeah, I like the process of writing content, scheduling content, engaging with content. And then, yeah, I solved that problem. So I guess I sell that problem now through Amplify X, but... I'd been waiting for, not waiting, I'd been stewing on doing a personal, like creating my own personal brand for, for quite a while. So to anyone thinking of starting now, do you think it's too late or it's a good time to start now? And what kind of tips would you give someone in that situation? Oh man, early, early the better, like the kids at school and stuff, I'm encouraging them 18, 19, 20, 21, even if it's just your personal brand and posting what you want even if it's just down the beach or surfing or fishing or you know whatever it is um just documenting what you like to do um and if you want to take it seriously it's just can being consistent like i just do a little bit every day i did a post about it yesterday the day before it's just yeah like i work full time i have a family i have hobbies and i still create content as much as some content creators that are, you know, full time in very commas. I just 
I batch my content, I schedule it, I repurpose it. Um, one screenshot from X can cover me for multiple platforms. So um, mm. I learned that from Dakota Robinson and Nicholas Verge and Clifton and these kind of guys that I've been able to learn from and speak to and ask questions on spaces. But I, everything comes from my written content. So I write in notes and then I'm able to screenshot repurpose, put it into Canva and I can put it onto LinkedIn and Instagram threads, all those kind of places. Um, so my advice is, you know, you all have a phone and you all like to do what you like to do. So <laughs> start documenting, start writing, start recording and your wins and your losses, you know, write about the things that didn't go so well. Um, that resonates really well with people, but just setting some time, would every day to engage, post and write, even if it's just once a day. Um, and I would be suggesting that you get on, you know, two or three platforms. I'd say LinkedIn, number one at the moment for me. Um, X, I think is a great place to start as well. And then if you're a visual and you're younger, you know, your X slash Instagram, um, are probably going to cover your written and your visual content. So, yeah, you... You can start at whatever age, just start now. Just start start posting, start writing and just do it 10 minutes, 20 minutes every day. Yeah, and like you said, by having your hobbies, having your family, your day job, you get so much inspiration for things to write about or to talk about that people sometimes they think, oh, it's, it's just a regular day. It's just normal, but it may be normal for you, but not necessarily for other people. So for instance, if you talk about living in Australia, to me, living in Brazil, halfway across the world, it's a totally different experience. So to me, it would be interesting, even if to you, it might seem like, oh, it's just something mundane. Normal. Yeah, something normal, something mundane. Yeah. But to you, it's interesting. Yeah. And the same thing goes the other way around. So many times I think people are a bit they are too self-conscious about starting because they think they don't have anything to say, but quite the contrary. I, I, I gave, I spoke to Dan West today and I, I gave some advice that I thought was, I think it's good advice for, for young people. And I actually did a post about it on LinkedIn just tonight that like no one really cares. Like I ask people all the time, um, do you remember what you posted last week? Do you remember what I posted last week? And they go, no. Nah. And I said, who cares then? And even when you're getting started, all of that content is like, it doesn't matter whether it performs well. It's just you've got to put the reps in. And I do repurpose some of my older content that's performed well. But if you don't look back and go, oh, that was a bit cringe or that was a bit shit, then you're not getting better. And I think, I think if you have that mindset, like if you're just posting it, it's like no one cares more than you. So you just got to get out of your own way. And, you know, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves generally are way far from reality. And it's just, it's one post and it's there and then it's gone. It's still there, but people aren't looking at it anymore. And when you first started, no one really sees it. So who cares anyway? Um, <laughs> a bit different now for me where I kind of go viral every second day. So... Um, you know, I, I outperform, you know, most other accounts and it's just been from all organic, but you're not going to get there overnight. So don't worry about that until you get it, get there. So, um, yeah, just set some time, schedule your posts, write your content, um, what inspires you, what, what you like to do and just start from there and yeah, ask people. One other thing I spoke to Dan about was, you know, those people that you look up to that you you think are cool creators, like what are they doing? You don't have to copycat them, but it's a good place to start and drive inspiration from. Yeah, there's this thing called the spotlight effect. So we tend to think that there's a spotlight <laughs> and everyone's looking at you and everyone's thinking about you. But at the end of the day, people are just minding their own business and mm. thinking about their, their own problems. And we tend to have this and when you start doing social media, you think that everyone's looking at you and everyone's noticing 
all of the typos you put in anything you write down or if you put video content you're super self-conscious but that thing kind of fades away after about a week or so or a month or so after you start putting out more and more stuff you just stop caring if people are looking or not and you actually want people to look after a while because you're not that self-conscious and you know that you have value when you talk to people yeah it's a different mindset being a creator than being a consumer and yeah i i answered that question earlier today it's like i want to be a creator so I yeah I do consume other content, but at the end of the day, I like to I like to um you know I like to create content, and most of it's written. But you know I have to yeah you have to put it out there because otherwise no one sees it. So um it's just part and parcel of the game. Um, yeah, and once you flip that switch. You can't get the genie back in the bottle. So it, mm. you have a very different mindset when you look at other people's things as well, because you're thinking, if I was doing this, how would I have done it? Or if you're looking at something, for instance, those super well-produced videos on YouTube, and you're thinking, wow, so the lighting must be this or that way, and the camera must be here. And you're imagining all of the different parts, all of the different things that they had to think about to produce that kind of content. So when you shift from a creator or a consumer to a creator, it's it's like night and day. What what do you think about that mind shift? Yeah, it's definitely like I feel like when you're consuming content, you're kind of like manifesting it and you're not taking any action. For me, I'm all about taking action, moving forward and I don't I don't want to just listen to content, watch content, read content. People read books all the time, self-help books. It's like, well, you actually got to go and do something. You got to help yourself. And so for me, it's like I try and have, you know, set periods of time where I'm like, I'm in a creative mindset and I'm in a consumer mindset and I'm becoming more and more and more creating mindset rather than consuming because I, I have confidence in the way I think, the way I write, in my businesses, the way I you know, approach things. So, yeah, it's a huge switch um, and it takes time. But as you create content and you get more engagement and you get more DMs and you get more collaborations, um, it makes things a lot easier um, for you to, to progress. And you start to see things as, oh, I can, I can do this better or what's the next thing rather than, trying to just watch all the time and just you're like a passenger you know i like to be in the driver's seat and i want to be able to control if i'm going left or right or speed up slow down so yeah it's just it's a mindset thing and it's skin in the game people want to be like i'm dealing with people whether they're clients or people online and they want to be where i am how are you getting so many comments and engage with them i've been doing this for a year flat out um posting every single day three four five times a day for a year so do it for a year and then come and talk to me if you're having problems you know so it's like it does take time so don't expect it just to you know flick a switch and you post one day and no one sees it well <laughs> you can't get disheartened you just gotta push through those barriers a bit yeah, like you said, when you start going to the gym, you're going to get those granny weights, those colorful weights, and you'll think, wow, I'll never be able to compete with those buff dudes. But if you go for months and months and years on end, eventually you'll get stronger. So it's, like you said before, about putting the reps. Yeah, and, I, and it's not just putting the reps. I had a big spiel at uh, my session today, my my best team I've got, my best basketball team. Um and I said, it's not just about getting reps in, it's about quality. And at the start, you have to just do the reps. And then as you get the basics down, and it's about refining, it's about quality. And I use that analogy that you said um, about going to the gym, but I said, once you start going to the gym, 
if you just go to the gym and you lift the same weights for every time you go there, yeah, you might get a little bit stronger and have a little bit of progression, but you're going to plateau. You have to stress the body. You have to overload it. You have to a couple of percent every day, a little bit more. And it doesn't have to be more in terms of time or, or effort necessarily. It just has to be more quality. You know, mm-hmm. it's like just a little bit more. And that's how I've created what I've created is just a little bit every day. And it just compounds. And you don't necessarily see it until you look back. But you do have to do the work, especially early days, especially when you're under that 100 followers, 200 followers, 500 followers. You do have to really put the reps in. But then it, then it's about that quality and you really have to start differentiating differentiating yourself and when you go to the gym you're putting that little 1.25 on and you're doing that extra rep and then you come back the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and all of a sudden you've got this big bank and a, and a much bigger following um and so yeah it's not just about putting the reps in it's got to be done in the right form <laughs> and progressive overload and uh, then you'll start seeing the results. So, um, but at the start, don't think too much. You know, it's just just get to the gym. People people have problems about putting their shoes on. It's like put the shoes on and go to the gym, and then worry about the next thing. A lot of people sit in that kind of um, almost like mental masturbation, that manifesting like, and that consumer mindset. Whereas yeah, when that flicks that switch into create a mindset, then you, then you're much more likely to keep on going, continue that momentum. Yeah, it's all about momentum, and that's why it's terrible if you lose momentum. So you can't let yourself lose that momentum as well. But I'd also like to go more into this that you were talking about, making these parallels between sports and business and especially because you have a lot of experience with basketball and with coaching kids so could you talk a little bit more about this about how this experience with coaching and mentoring kids has helped you with business as well you have to learn to fail in public and i've been posting quite a bit about this recently is that if you want to win at the game you have to play the game you can't sit on the sidelines. You can't be a spectator. You can't be a consumer. You know, that's the parallel. You're sitting in the stands watching. So you're never going to have the audience of those players or those business people that are willing to put their neck on the, out on the line, do the work, do the reps, post every single day, create a business. You might fail, but that doesn't matter. You got to get up the next day. All right, what? Why didn't it work? Learn from it, pivot, go somewhere else, and all the successful people, whether it's sport or business, do the exact same. They fail publicly, you know, and they do all of the work behind the scenes. Ninety percent is all done that no one sees. You know, you talk about Kobe, Tiger, whoever else. They've hit hundreds of thousands of balls. Hundreds of thousands of shots. Um, it's the same business. It's your life experience, your network, um, your skills. Are you willing to put your neck out and do something in public? And it might fail. But the thing is, it might succeed. But you can't sit on the sidelines because you'll never find out. So that's the main one for me. Um, I think that's a great parallel between the two. Yeah, it's a great parallel. And since you mentioned Kobe, and he's very famous for having that Mamba mentality of his. And for I've seen a bunch of interviews when he talks about going to the gym at 5 a.m., getting yeah, a workout love, done. That. The, the blocks, you know, he, he has those, you know, um, compounding blocks. And the, the one that you're talking about, he kind of he gets up five and he shoots from five till seven. He has a break. He goes to the gym from nine to eleven. He has lunch. He goes and gets a workout from you know this time to this time, and then he goes back, has a break, and he goes. Exactly. Most people have only most people have only done that one session. I've done four, 
in one day for 15 years. So that compound interest, he's just got that a little bit better than everyone else. Um, but his food and nutrition and recovery, so he's done fitness, he's done his weightlifting, he's done his shooting, he's done his team stuff all in the day. Um, and I love that because I've adapted that mindset into what I do. They're just little sprints every day. So when I set time to write, I've got, you know, whatever time that I'm, you know, it might be early in the morning, it might be late at night. I might do a meditation or some breath work and then I'll write for 20 minutes. Sometimes in that time, it's, I don't really have anything. But then some days it's flowing and it's good. But you have to set that time for that to happen. Um, then I've got time that I've got training or at school and then I've got family time. So it's like those segments, I'm present with what I'm doing and my day is pretty well set out. And, you know, that's, that's what makes, you know, your life super intentional. Um, and Kobe's, yeah, that's one of my favorite, um, yeah, videos of Kobe. And, you know, he, he talks about how intentional he is with his time and his recovery. Um, and that compounds over time and it takes a year to, like I look back on it now and I'm only just seeing the fruits of my labor a year in you know so um but I'm starting from uh, a place of life experience as well um whereas a 21 year old might not quite have that life experience um but if you're intentional with your time um and what you're doing in that time block um for a year, two years, 10 years, I always look at the growth rate that I'm on, I'm on now and I don't want to do anything that I, I don't want to be doing in five, 10 years. So what's my audience going to be like in 10 years? You know, um, it's going to be pretty big if I post every day for 10 years um, and not often people look at that. And I'm not saying that you should look that far ahead like you need to pivot and whatnot and who knows what social media would be like in 10 years but um i pick the things that i want to do and what my decision is do i want to be working with this person in 10 years do i want to be doing this activity in 10 years do i want to be, be does it align with my values and if it does then it can go on the calendar <laughs> and the structure of the day so um yeah, it's, it's all just about being intentional, and yeah, he was the king of that. So, yeah, Kobe was an absolute legend. But I think you hit the nail in the head when you talk about intentionality and having that kind of focus, and always remembering what your goals are and what's important to you. Because I think many people end up letting the craziness or the hurricane of daily life get to them, and then you kind of miss. What's important to you? So is your family important to you or is your business important to you, your health? And many people end up either they get completely lost and there are too many plates to keep in the air and they just like let them all fall to the ground or they focus too much on one of them and end up letting the others fall. So I think having this intentionality and dividing your day into little sprints, dividing your week, dividing your month, and also trying to think a little bit more down the line, like you said, thinking five years down the line, 10 years down the line. So you can have that intentionality and that focus is very important. But unfortunately, many people don't have that. So being a coach and having coached so many people over these years, what kind of tips would you give them? so that they can be more intentional about their goals and about achieving them? That's a great question. Uh, and like, obviously it changes over time. Like I've recently become a dad and like that changes, like obviously how I think and um, not everyone's going to be at those stages. But I think when it comes to being intentional, you really have to spend time with yourself to figure out why you're doing something and what what you love. Um, like I love competing and I love um, I love winning, but then I also love nature and I love 
um, like surfing and like you you hit my pillars on the head like health wealth family and um yeah like for me um you know i i have some very clear values that i've put into sentences um and you know outcomes that um that drive me and whenever i speak to clients or younger kids i'm like what you know what's what's your passion and it's not just like your passion in the sense of at that current you know point in time because someone might love video games or someone might love i don't know pokemon or i don't know um you know i'm talking more like what are the things that you know when you look back at your ideal day um, is another way of looking at it. It's like, what, who are you spending time with? What are you doing? And um, when, when have you had big wins and when you've had big losses and looking at, you know, who, who gets you going and who's, who's on your team and who's on your side. But when it comes to intentionality, especially with the younger kids, um, they go through these big ebbs and flows and they, they chop and change um which is really hard to to decipher what they really do want to do and i think spending time with themselves um there's so much stimulus coming at them that you have to kind of take a step back and go what what do i without influence of other people like what because especially at the younger age, they're so influenced by their parents and by their friends and what their mm-hmm. peers and colleagues are doing. Um, and it's leaning in and embracing their weird and that's generally where the, the golden nuggets are. They're a little bit of weird, embracing it, and that's where um, then they can step into um, actually setting up what direction they want to go to and a lot of kids have been pushed into university and those kind of things whereas i come at a different angle and go what do you like doing and then how can we embed that and yeah it's 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 hard to do but um i think i think once you get used to embracing what you're good at what you enjoy doing and what is providing good to the community. Kind of ikigai, that Japanese kind of saying mm-hmm. is is very much true. Um, generally, it's around those three things, you know, what you're good at, what you love to do and what's providing a purpose to the community that matches with those values. So we're all problem solvers and we're all, you know, want to be surrounded by people that support us. So. It's, it's a tricky one. You've got to have a good relationship with someone that you can trust to talk to. So um, whether that's a teacher, coach, uncle, and yeah, every conversation is different, but it's just getting to know, you know. Some people don't even realise what they're good at. Like sometimes I'll say to a kid, oh, you're really good at this. And like, oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Or have you ever thought about doing this? And go, no, nah, I've not thought about that. So sometimes it is good to have, you know, different opinions and different avenues to to go down for sure yeah especially in adolescence because everything's changing your body's changing you everything around you is changing and like you said you tend to be very influenceable by your friends like social group around you so if you don't take that step back it's hard to even know what you actually like and I think maybe to more introverted kind of kids, that might be a bit easier because they're more used to being on their own and they kind of crave that. But maybe to extroverted kids, they might be a bit more influenceable. I don't know, just thinking out loud right now. Yeah, they're more creative. Like a lot of creative kids, you know, they're um, the kids that, you know, they might not make the biggest noise, but. You know they're they're able to you know they they can draw really well or they paint really well or they write really well or they're an amazing singer or they're very talented at like playing instruments or 
you know, there's all these, you know, or sport even, different types of sport or, and yeah, it's kind of just leaning into that and, you know, some of these kids that, you know, they're a little bit weird, but, you know, I I think that's what makes the greats the greats is they've all, they're all a little bit crazy. They're all a little bit weird. And um, I think, yeah, you have to lean into that a bit, <laughs> you know, that's, that's who you are. You don't, you know, try not to fight that for too long. Um, and that you know, kind of built into why people postpone, you know, potentially cre- content creating because, you know, I have some views that, you know, some people don't agree with and I used to not, you know, say them or whatnot. And nowadays it's kind of, I think a lot of people are more so on my side than I think. And um, you've got to voice those opinions. I have a very different philosophy um, with my program and I, I lose some kids for it, but I also gain a lot of kids from it too. So, um, yeah. Yeah, man, I think it's about letting your authentic self out and then people that resonate with who you really are and what you're saying, they will naturally be attracted to you because like you said, many times we're a bit afraid of putting out our weird sides, but there are also a lot of people that are afraid of putting out their weird and their weird might be similar to your weird. So if they see someone that's weird like them, they'll be attracted to them naturally. Yeah, you'll find your tribe. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Yeah, so it's one of those things with... um, We've had a generation of kids that are very much participation based and you get a medal for participating and, you know, there's no winners and there's no losers. Um, whereas I train and play to win and I, I play my best players and you earn your minutes, you earn your court time because that's real world. And I think it's unfair to the most talented players that work the hardest if they were to play the same amount of time as the young kid who's still learning how to play. It's not as talented, not as athletic. Might work relatively hard, but it's just not there yet. I'm not saying they're not going to get opportunities, but I'm going to pick my best team. I'm going to play my best team and you will earn your spot and you will earn your minutes. And, um, you know, I get a lot of parents kick back saying, you know, all the kids should play the same amount of time. And why is my son not playing? And why was he not selected for this team? And um, there's a door. You know, it's like, um, it's not how life works. It's not how sport works. Um, and I'm not saying that I get it right 100% of the time, but... Um, I think it is unfair to the top players if I don't do it that way. And I think it's unfair to the sport um, because it's it's not equality. We're not talking about equality. <laughs> you know, it's it, it, we're playing to win. So um, it's a different mindset. And the the parents and the kids who are talented and work very hard, they love it. It's generally the kids that are not so good, the ones that don't train as hard and um, have been given everything, you know, along the way. They're the ones that are the ones that push back, I guess. Yeah, this reminds me of Kobe again when he made that. He didn't make the list, but there was this list of the top American players in his age bracket, and he he made a point to beat all of them one-on-one so and he knew he wouldn't be able to do this like this year or next year he had to have a long-term vision i think he was like 12 or 13 when he did this list and that's when he started with all of those mentalities that we were talking about before of training more than the rest because he knew that the compound interest would make him better and better and be able to beat those other guys that maybe they were more talented naturally but they were also more complacent than him. So he knew that by putting in the hard work, he would be able to get better and better. And I agree with you about, I think sports might be one of the last beacons 
of actual meritocracy, especially to kids. Yeah, I went went to a carnival the other day. They didn't score, and there was no winners or losers. Like it, this, is, the world's gone mad. It's ridiculous. Um, I hate it, and um, there, there's going to be a pushback. There will be a change, and um, the majority will fight back, and <laughs> it'll come back the other way. And I think. I don't mind kids that want to go and participate and play for fun. Not a problem. You know, like I, I, I do. I have both sides of sport. Like I love my recreation sport. Like I love surfing, fishing, all those kind of things. It's in a non-competitive way. Um, but when we're talking about high-level sport or even junior sport, I get that there's a high-level amount of pressure with these kids. But pressure is a privilege. You're playing in front of a crowd. You're playing for something that's worthwhile. Um, you've trained hard for it. You work hard for it. If it didn't mean anything to you, then you probably shouldn't play. If you don't feel a bit of pressure, then you probably don't care and you should probably go and do something else. Um, so I, I think there will be a shift um, to players and to parents that, hey, you need to realise that. This is not a participation award sport and we're playing to win and whether you like it or not, you might win some days, you might lose some days, but you turn up to training the next week and we get a little bit better and that's all we ask for. You, you go out there and, and you give your best and sometimes you fall short, but yeah, you've got to play the game to win. You can't just sit on the sidelines. And say everyone, you tried so you tried so hard. Well done. It's just, it's yeah, but you lost. <laughs> exactly, it's it's not real life, and it's the same business. So, ninety you percent know, of startups fail. So, you know, it's one of those things where if you're not willing to to enter the game, you're not risking something. And I think it does that. That's true. It, it comes down to risk taking. We're so risk adverse. Do you know what I mean? I got a book for you. <clears throat> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I know Luke Longley pretty well. Bill Jackson did the forward. That's so cool, man. This is original, 1996. His house what's... burnt down. His house burnt down with his ring in it and everything. Wow. Yeah, dude. So yeah. you were a, a Bulls fan at the time or not? Ah, uh, nah, I've been a Jazz fan. Jazz fan. John Stockton. So, yeah. so you guys were always had your hopes crushed by the Bulls in the yeah. finals then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good old Carl. I named one of my students after Carl Malone. He's got the same last name and he's a big rig, so... Give him big car Malone, but yeah, man, I think there's going to be a bit of a pushback here soon. Um, there has to be, and um, we've gone too far the other way. It's got to start coming back. So, and I hope it does, because I love competing. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it will, because people love sports because of that competitive aspect. They like the people that actually love sports because they're also, like you said, the parents that want their kid to play more. But people who like sports, you like to see the best guys going at it 100%, be it in basketball, soccer, Formula One, whatever it is. But you want to see the best dudes having like this 100% adrenaline, testosterone, whatever it is. And you just want to see them head to head. And I think that's what makes so many people love sports at the end of the day, like competing and being better every day. Like you said before as well, like going to practice to try to get a little better every day, like practicing your shots, practicing your speed, whatever it is. And I think it's, I think it's going back. I think we have this pendulum swings in society. And I think this is one of the things that will come back soon enough. Hopefully. Yeah, I think I think it will too. I hope so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and what made you like John Stockton so much? And do you think that 
the players we tend to gravitate towards to be our idols, they they have something to do with our own personalities as well because John Stockton was a point guard. And, but there are people that love the more flashy players like a LeBron James, for instance, in his prime. So do you think that has to do with personality as well? Yeah, I... Yeah, I think we talked about this in our podcast that never got to air because of my internet, but I was always a small white kid and um, I always played point guard and I've thrown some pretty ridiculous passes in my time and they were all derived from, you know, John Stockton and then later on Steve Nash, who he went on to break, break his record, didn't he? Um, yes, yeah, this if one, uh, no, I think... Does John still have it? Anyway, what Steve Nash, St- Steve Nash had a had a stack stack of assists as well, but yeah, you know, I was yeah, really he sure. still has it by a landslide. Yeah, was it twelve thousand something? Was it? Yeah, it's fifteen thousand eight hundred. Fifteen thousand. Yeah, what's yeah, the what's, second what's one Steve is Nash? Jason Kidd with twelve thousand. Steve Nash yeah, is right. ten thousand three hundred. Ten thousand. So that's a lot. That's still a lot. Um, it is. But yeah, I just I was never the most athletic. I had to use IQ um, and making better decisions. Everything's about decision making, seeing what's happening before it happens, and just straight up hustle. And um, you know, it's near on impossible for me to be LeBron James. Like he's a freak of nature, um, like athletically. You know, John Stockton's like two inches taller than me. Um, you know, probably weighs 15 kilos heavier than me. So it was like, that's not so far out of reach. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, whereas I'm not going to be six foot eight, you know, 200, 200 pounds and with a, you know, 70, 70 inch vertic- vert. So um, I looked up to him because he was great, but he was also my ICP <laughs> he was my you know he was he spoke the way I like people to speak he's very um he's kind of like almost Australian he's very like calm and relaxed but he also has that passion and grit to win um and he does he used to get hyped up a few times as well and you know he just made such good decisions and there's you know, I loved it, like some of his bounce passes, which was not so common back then, which are quite common now. Like some of those one arm bounce passes and like that kind of pick and roll, splitting defenders and just I could do the I could do similar things, so I resonated with that. Um and yeah, I just I stuck with the jazz and you know one of my favorite players, Joe Ingles, went over there and played. And I, I've met him a couple of times and um, yeah, so I've always followed followed the the Utah Jazz. But um, yeah, I think it, you relate to the people that are you know similar to you. And since you mentioned meeting one of the legends that you really enjoyed seeing playing. And I know you've traveled extensively to play basketball or to coach. So what do you think were the most important, like the most important experiences you had through basketball and the people you met, the best tournaments or trips you had? Like, What were the top highlights, you think? I've got two. I'm looking up my medal up there. Um, I... We have like our college system um, in Australia and we have, instead of playing all year, you play one tournament and the whole of Australia come and we play um, all the top universities. So I went to UWA, which is our top university, University of Western Australia. And um, we went to Gold Coast and we came third. We got a bronze medal and there's like hundreds of teams there. And I was like, this is crazy. And I was so impressed. And then we went back the following year and we won. We took the whole thing out. We had the best team, one of the best teams I've ever played in. And um, 
then we got invited to an international tournament, university games, international tournament in Hong Kong. But I was ineligible to play because I'd finished my degree the following year. So I went over to coach and I'll never forget we were staying at the university and um, they had a big opening dinner. There was like 400 people there. And we're like, shit, this is serious. And um, we went and trained the next day. And then we had a game at night. And we were in the feature game. And we walked in and it's packed to the rafters. There's probably 500, 600 people, massive grandstand. And I'm looking around like, all right. And there's eight players and me, nine of us, and a team manager. Um, because they, we, we had a volleyball team and they came over as well. And so the volleyball team are sitting behind the bench and um, we've always run this one particular play off the tip because we had a really strong um, centre, but he was really long. And we had another guy who was super athletic and we never lost a tip, never. So we could always run a play off it and... Um, I said, all right, boys, let's start this thing off with a bang. And um, we set it up and he's gone up, tipped the ball down. We've got the ball, kicked it ahead straight away. And our best player who had a wild, Perth Wildcats contract at the time, left-hander, has gone one, two, and just cocked this thing back and jammed this thing so hard. And the whole crowd is just like, Whoa. <laughs> and then they all look, I'm looking around and I'm like, all right, let's go. And we went undefeated and we won the whole thing in Hong Kong. Um, and they play street ball, nonstop street ball. There's no structure. There's no plays. They're just street ball. We're playing like the Philippines and Singapore, Hong Kong, all these teams and just so different type of basketball. But, um, we, we made it to the grand final and, um, yeah, we played out of our skin and, um, we went to the presentation night and we had these big medals and we were walking around the city of Hong Kong with the, the these big basketballers and people are coming up to us and like, who are you guys? And like, like, um, so yeah, that was, that was one of my favorites, but. I've traveled all around Australia, you know, into America, um, you know, Asia. And yeah, it's, it's always been amazing. And yeah, you know, win some, lose some, but it's just, yeah, the experience of going and competing. Um, but yeah, those two trips were pretty special. Um, and then two years later, um, I went back to do my teaching degree and we won in Perth. It was hosted in Perth um, and we threw the biggest party for like three days. Um, we went out, we went out to the nightclub in our jerseys and um, they let us in. <laughs> they let us in with our jerseys and um, yeah, it was a pretty wild time. But yeah, like the boys did the work, you know, like we worked really hard behind the scenes. Um, we trained a lot. We gymed a lot. Um, we were super fit. We played a lot together and, yeah, that was probably one of the best teams I was a part of and all amateur, you know, no paid. Like, no one was getting paid. We used to have sausage sizzles to, to raise the money so we could to go away. But, um, yeah, it's it's been some crazy, crazy rides, that's for sure. That's awesome, man. <coughs> Do you prefer being a coach or a player? Different. Um, I think I do miss the, the war of playing, like the contest of playing. Um, but I love the strategy of coaching and you've got to make a lot of decisions. Um, so yeah, it's a tricky one. I, I don't miss playing, um. But I think I prefer coaching. I'm, I'm probably a better coach than I was player. <laughs> Put it that way. 
Um, you know, it's one of those things where you don't have to be the best player to be a really good coach, but you can't really go the other way. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I probably had a bit bigger impact on, on the game and on players being a coach. But, um, yeah, it was, you know, like my, yeah, like Luke, he lives in North Carolina. He, you know, he's in Div 1 college and, you know, I, I, you know, I consider him like a brother. He's was super successful and he's, you know, umpiring at a, at a Division 1, like college level. And I think everyone, you know, after the after you stop playing, goes into different avenues, whether it's media or umpiring or coaching or mentoring or do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's like I probably prefer coaching to answer your question. <laughs> more strategic side of things yeah yeah for sure it's upstairs for thinking <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think john stockton might answer similarly to you as well because he was always tr playing with his mind more than with his body yeah ta the tactics you know is endless you know endless decisions so and it's just problem solving same as in business like I love business and I love sales and marketing now as well. And yeah, I get a similar rush out of that, you know. Um, it's a bit of a gamble and I'm happy to take the gamble and I want to be in the game and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, but you've got to put your hat in the ring to have a crack. <laughs> yeah, you need to <laughs> be always playing and forgot what I was going to ask you now. No, you're right. It'll come back to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. And do you think that through sport, you can learn a lot of intangibles, like dealing with pressure, like we were talking about before, and dealing with teamwork as well? That's a big thing with leadership. What, what kind of intangible skills do you think you can learn and how can you teach them to those kids as well? All of them, and you don't teach it. People, anyone that can tell you that they can teach those skills are full of shit. How the fuck are you supposed to teach resilience? You don't teach resilience. You don't learn resilience. <laughs> You've got to actually do something. <laughs> like, it's not... It's, it's something that people want to talk about. But you learn everything in sport. It's, you know, there's guidelines. There's rules. You have to know the rules. You've got to play by the rules. There's moral conduct. There's ethics. There's respect between teammates, between the opposition to the umpire. There's discipline. There's teamwork. There's leadership. But it's not leadership that there's one leader it's like you're the leader of yourself and the people next to you there's a screen coming there's a screen coming that's leadership you're sitting on the bench and you're watching and you're in, you're engaged and you're ready to go um and you're gonna win you're gonna lose you're gonna draw you're gonna have good games you're gonna have bad games you're gonna have you're gonna have a really good game personally and your team's gonna lose that's it's a terrible feeling and vice versa. So you don't learn or teach resilience. You you have to you have to be in the game to get the benefits. You know, and as you do that more, as you put yourself under more pressure over periods of time, you build that resilience. It's like layers of paint. It's just one stroke, another stroke, and it's like. You don't just go to a resilience course and all of a sudden you've got resilience. Like it, it's, it's just not how it works. Um, and that comes back to this participation. It's like, well, kids don't have resilience as well. They've been given everything they want whenever they want. It does matter when they lose. They don't have to do the work for it. Everyone gets a participation star. Well, of course I don't have any resilience. <laughs> um, 
So, <laughs> well, that's my philosophy anyway. That, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but that's that's what I'm going with at the moment anyway. Yeah, I love your take on leadership because, yeah, like you said, you, you don't need to be the coach to be the leader or the president of the team or whatever it is. Each and every teammate has a responsibility within himself and within his other teammates and every interaction he has with them is a form of t leadership as well. And it's all about teamwork as well. And yeah, I thought that was a very interesting take on leadership. And what about the things you can teach to the, these kids and the things that they can learn not only by experience, but also by guidance. And do you think that there's such a thing as a natural born leader or someone, some people are born with these things that there are more of a strong suit to them or do you learn them all, always? I think it usually it's more aligned with competence, you know what I mean? <clears throat> like most leaders are competent in that particular area. Um, so it's pretty hard to be a leader when you're not competent in that particular skill or sport or athletic pursuit. Um, and, you know, genetics, genetics are going to play part to whether they're naturally good at certain things. Does that make them a natural leader? Potentially. Um, you know, can you have a mentor and can you learn leadership? Yeah, of course you can. It's going to take time though and you've got to stick to certain a certain topic or area for a period of time until you get that competence. So you need competence, then confidence, and then you've got leadership. So you need a, you, like, you can't be a leader in something that you don't know anything about and you can't be competent until you develop the basics. And when you have confidence in your own ability to, to deliver, then you can start leading people. So, like, it's 100% true, like what we're talking about before, in everyone plays their role and there's always someone behind you and there's always someone in front of you. So you're always going to be a mentor, a leader, a learner, all in the same, like, instance. So... I don't think, you know, people just, you know, are born leaders and I don't think they're just created either. I think it it has to be both. Um, but you can you can develop that over time, um, even if you're not genetically gifted as such. And what about setting goals and visualizing them? For instance, at the beginning of the year, of course, you always tell your team that you want to be the champions but you have the whole year ahead of you and a lot of training sessions, a lot of games. So how do you keep them motivated and with the eyes on the prize? Oh, that's a really hard one. I, I'm not a big goal setter. Like I, I like to prepare and with the preparation comes that confidence. And if we go out there and give our best and we lose, so be it. Um, but I don't, I'm trying to manage expectations because I don't want to, you know, there might be some really good teams that we're playing and I don't want to psych the boys out of that or I'm more than happy to prep the work and go out there and and where we've done the work and we're confident in our ability and our teammates that when we rock up, on game day that we're ready to roll and yeah I'm not you know I, I don't do goal setting individually or as a team um, it's more so you sign the contract and if you want to be here you sign the contract this is when we train this is when we're playing and yeah like we don't lose very often but you know it's you know I don't I don't say like oh if we don't win the championship, then I'm going to be pissed or like it's, it's more so like holding that standard and then continuing that standard in training 
and in games that um, if you want to play for us, um, then you meet these standards. And um, yeah, that's that's more the philosophy that I have around it rather than trying to be super strategic with, you know, goal setting, I guess. And what about the scheduling of the practices and do you employ more of a strategic thinking into that, into what type of practicing we should do so that the players can improve in this or that specific fundamental or we can try to run some other kind of plays? Do you, like, when you begin the year or when you begin the month, the week, do you have that kind of uh, situation in which you're strategizing about the practices and how you want them to be? Yeah, we have external coaches come in and we do strength and conditioning and we're very intentional with, you know, what days we train and what what time of the season. So we really back off this time of year because it's winter and it's we're full-blown. Whereas term one, term four in the summertime, we can do more of the conditioning and the skills and and the weightlifting and plyometrics. Whereas in term two and three, we're very much about our structures, our gameplay, preparing for certain teams. And um, yeah, like we have a specific style of basketball that we play where, you know, super high intensity, run and gun, um, very defense orientated. And we also shoot the ball. Um, if we're open, we'll shoot it. And um, that's the style we play. Um, but yeah, we, we're very structured through the year um, when we're setting up our training sessions and our dates. And yeah, it's the same as, you know, as in businesses. It's like we're going to have sprints here and then we're going to relax here. We're going to sprint here, we'll relax here. Um, we're going to lay off the weights and we're going to do more recovery. Um, you know, or we have a big tournament coming up, we'll, we'll taper off and ease off into it and be ready to go. Um, our big interstate tournament has just gone. So we've, you know, our big tournament for the year has already been. So, yeah, we, we think about all of those things and we're super strategic in, in how we get the best out of our plays and we don't always get it right, but it's forever changing and um, we're adapting to it all the time. And back to business, how do these skills that you learn through basketball and through coaching translate to how you employ them in your business philosophy? I think it's um, when I'm like coaching clients and whatnot, um, I'm able to yeah ask better questions and, and listen and trying to understand what problems they have. And I'm used to having to think on the fly and um, problem solve and I'm used to being under pressure. Um, so it all comes into play, you know. Um, with with Amplify, like we, you know, we're employing a few people now as well. So it's, you know, trying to attract talent and keep talent. Um, and, yeah, it's all communication skills and being able to delegate. And that's a large part of my role um, as being the head of basketball. Like not only do I coach, but I'm doing admin behind the scenes and I'm employing coaches and um, organizing buses. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it's a lot of juggling plates. Um, and it's the same in business, especially with Amplify. It's very much dynamic. Um, and, yeah, you've got to be able to communicate and problem solve and Sometimes shit hit, hits the fan and you've got to not be reactive. You've got to go, all right, take a step back. What's happened? You know, no one's died, first of all. Um, let's take a step back and then, you know, let's make a decision. And can we solve the problem? Um, so yeah, it, it, there's definitely some, some parallels there for sure. And in Amplify, you guys talk about transferring your brands from generic to fun. To fun, yeah. Well, and, I just, and that's interesting. Yeah, it's just like there's so many plain Jane 
you don't have to do much to stand out. Well, first of all, if you're not posting, you're never going to stand out. But if you start posting and it's just like blah, de, blah, de, blah, um, boring shit. Um, yeah, it's like if you if you have fun with something, are you going to want to keep doing it? Generally, yeah. So um, if I can make it, you know, if I can, you know, lean into your content and the things that you enjoy that are fun, and are colourful and are bright and engaging, you know, that's going to show in your personal brand. So for me, it's part business, part personal, you know, part fun. You know, you got to put in your personality, um, you know, and you got these, you know, these thoughts and ideas and stories and funny things that have happened to you. And the more you lean into that, more you embrace your, you know, imperfections and your weirdness and uh, the things you like to do, the more fun it is. But we just, we see it all the time, just people posting the same boring shit over and over and over again. And it's like, and they're like, well, why does no one follow me? And why does no one engage with my content? It's like, because it's boring and it sucks. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, man, it's just like, uh, like as much as I love winning and take you know business and sport pretty seriously, like it's fun, and it's fun to me. So, um, I want people to have fun when it's when they're creating their personal brand or even I'm working with businesses and stuff as well. It's like, you know, enjoy it, let your employees enjoy it, and lean into it, have some fun, and it doesn't always have to be so serious all the time or so bland and boring. So. And it's not hard to stand out. <laughs> it just takes a few little small changes in the way you write or the way you create content and, yeah, you're flying. Yeah, work takes too much time in our lives for us not to have fun with it. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, it's a great philosophy. Yeah. And do you think that you have some examples that you can share with people that might be listening of creators that embrace their weirdness and embrace their fun side so that they can try to emulate a little bit? Yeah, like I was on a, did a, I had a call with um, Daniel West who we were talking about earlier and he, yeah, he's great. He talks about how he lost $90,000 um, through a business partner that stole it. Um, it was an NFT project or something and, yeah, yeah, he he posts you know some authority content. He posts some personal content, but he posts his wins and his losses, and he posts his th thoughts and actual opinions on things. Um, you know, it's I think it's I think it's really really good. Like, um, like Michael Garristo is a really you know, he's not a huge content creator. He's like similar size to me, um, in similar business to me. He's a Canadian dude. He's awesome. Um, his saying is spend more time with your dog. <laughs> um, so like he's, you know, but, you know, he's, he helps very similar to what I do. Um, you know, my saying is kind of work on your business, not in your business. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, he leans into that, you know, spend more time playing with your dog um, kind of philosophy. And he's very funny and there's videos of him, you know, jumping in ice baths and running down the road with mittens on. <laughs> yeah. Like it, and, it, and there's a bunch of them, like Dakota Robinson's, you know, one that, you know, is a big content creator that, you know, he's very specific with his content, but, you know, he, he puts his thoughts out there and he has a bit of fun and he has an opinion and he, he sticks his neck out and he's happy to be right or wrong. Um, but, yeah, there's a bunch of them. But, yeah, there's there's three that come to mind that I really look up to and, and I, that I know and I've spoken to personally and, um yeah, like I lean into like pineapple on pizza and drinking black coffee and having a ginger beard and, you know, being Australian and um, like it's not hard to, you know, to make things a bit more fresh and fun. But, yeah, it's like find, find like you said, find your tribe, find the people that resonate with you that are, that are having fun with their content and, you know, follow them and comment and, yeah, 
and you never know whether they comment back or like back or people will see your comments and those kind of things. So, yeah, hope that answers your question anyway. Yeah. What about the watermelon? Yeah, watermelon. Like, um, I did a poll. Um, a lot of people wanted pineapple and um, we've been testing some branding and um, my partner's helped me with some designs and we want to do some merch and stuff down the track and everyone kind of likes watermelon and my daughter loves watermelon and um, yeah, it's something that I thoroughly enjoy eating and I like the colours and I like the branding and it sticks out <laughs> and not a lot of people do it. Some people do. Um, but, yeah, quite often people are like, you're the pineapple on pizza guy. Like, you need to have a pineapple. So uh, <laughs> it was a hard one to decide, but I left it up to the people and the people decided watermelon. So a um, few Thank hundred God. people. Yes, yes. A few, a few hundred people voted on both polls that I did. So um, it was unanimous for the watermelon. <laughs> Pineapple doesn't belong on pizza, for God's sake. I used to like you, Gabe, but um, we're going to have to uh, stop being friends now, mate. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it, it riles kids up too. Like I use it at school all the time. Um, and, yeah, it's like it's friendly banter, fun banter, and I think we should do more of it. And, um, you know, it's it's not hard to do. It's like, you know, have an opinion on something, stand by it and um, stick your neck out and uh, support your team, support your tribe. You know, I, I like tomato sauce. I don't like barbecue sauce as much. Um, you know, McDonald's sucks. Um, oh, yeah. I agree with that one. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's not hard. Just lean into the, some opinions that you have and yeah, people will go wild over it. So. <laughs> That's what I do anyway. Yeah, yeah. You're just Andrew Tating your way. <laughs> well, it's true. It's polarizing polarizing and people like it and people you know, it's attention, it's impressions. And, you know, it's I don't post about it every single day or you know but I think you have to embed some form of branding and fun into it not only for you but for the people that are you know potentially see your content and yeah i try and put mine into thirds you know into part business part personal part fun and then that way it's you know not all one or the other and do you do that with four platforms yeah i i've been testing doing some more personal and fun on LinkedIn and it's performing fine. So, um, yeah, I, I, I try and keep it some business, some personal and yeah, I, I'm embedding some more, um, meme fun related stuff into LinkedIn, but, um, I do like Sundays on X cause I usually shit post on Sundays. Um, and I like to have fun, man. I like to have a laugh and I enjoy, I enjoy comedy and I enjoy not taking things too seriously and um, I like winding people up. So, um, yeah, and I'm willing to cop backlash too. Like some people don't like it. Whatever. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> yeah, man. Even Jesus didn't have everyone liking him. So whatever happens. And going <laughs> back to... To that thing about working on your business instead of working in your business. I think many people don't understand what you mean. So could you talk about that? Yeah, like I feel most people start a business and um, they end up being the CEO and the sales guy and the marketing and the content creator and the customer service and the website designer and whoops, all of the things, all of the things. And I think their best asset or the best asset of the business owner 
is to be working on what brings our business the most amount of money and everything else needs to be either automated or outsourced. So, um, yeah, if you think about it as a structure of if you're the boss and you're best, you know, you're really good at marketing and bringing in clients, if you're spending all day creating content and working on the website and you're not bringing any clients, your business is not going to go very good. So the idea is you're working on your business and developing those structures to bring in the most amount of clients and business and then you're either hiring or outsourcing or automating you know, the content creation, which is what I do, the scheduling, which is what also I do, the engagement, which also I do, um, websites, landing pages, newsletters, um, which we've all added on into Amplify over time. So... Yeah, we're trying to create a bit more of a full stack, um, I guess, structure to allowing, you know, solopreneurs or business owners to focus on what they're good at and when it comes to the other things, let someone else take care of it, you know. And I learned that early on and, um, yeah, I had a few very quiet months when I was doing all of the things and then as soon as I stopped doing that, I started getting more inbound clients. I could get on podcasts and spaces and calls and stuff. So, yeah, it's literally that you're working on the direction of your business rather than right down in the weeds in it <laughs> um, as such. So, yeah, that's the analogy that I use. Yeah, I love something you posted the other day about don't trade your nine to five to 24 seven. And I think it has all to do with this. Yeah, for sure. Exactly right. Like people think having a business is easy and it's not. Um, and I learned that very quickly. The first holiday I went on about six months ago, um, that if you, if you go away for a week and your business doesn't run, <laughs> you don't have a business, you have a nine to five. And, um, I got a coach and who's become a good friend of mine that I do business with now and um, he helped me set up those structures and get a VA and use um, Metrical, which is our scheduler planner that we use now. And when I go away, I can go away up north fishing with no service for a week and my business will continue to run and I don't have to worry about it. But... Um, yeah, it's it's taken time to get to where I am, and um, yeah, yeah, I don't want to trade my nine for five for a twenty four seven. I want to be able to work for you know two to four hours a day, and um, I, it's not that I don't want to work. I enjoy working. I love the people I work with and the people I've met, like yourself. Um, so it's not like oh, I want to retire and sell the business or whatever it's not that it's being yeah intentional with my time and um yeah knowing that if i do go away for a week that the business is still going to run and um i don't have to sit at the computer all day every day to make sure checking that everything's um working well so yeah that's a that's a good post i'm glad you liked it <laughs> i got a fair, yeah, good, fair good hits on it yeah i really liked it and got me thinking about the fire movement as well do you know the fire movement yeah that was retirement early um yeah yeah I, uh, I, yeah i have followed it and i've watched a lot of the content and um you know dana white right mm, uh, the head of the ufc so. the president ah, of the dana ufc white. Yeah, yeah 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 um i'm more like him like i'm a bulldog like i want to play the game and i want to I'm happy to gamble. I'm happy to, to risk it. And, um, yeah, like I don't, I don't necessarily want to like retire and sit on the beach, and not do anything. Like I want to keep doing what I'm doing and I want to do it into my 50s, 60s, 70s. And whether that's what I'm doing now, probably not. It'd be something different, but, 
um, it will lead me to where I'm going um, eventually. So, um, yeah, I like, you know, obviously you want to have some kind of financial um, background and having understanding how to invest. And, yeah, I'm pretty lucky. My dad's an accountant and has been in the business world for a long time. Um, yeah, like I own my car, I own my house and, you know, I've got superannuation and um, I've got a daughter and we've got trust set up. And so, like, I, I understand playing the game of financial independence. Um, it's a bit tough right now with, like, obviously the way the banks are and inflation and all those kind of things. But, um, yeah, my aim, dude, is not um, to to retire early. Um and I, and I think that's probably taken out of context that they probably don't want to either, but I want to do business and I want to play high stakes levels, level games. And I want to play with the big boys. I'm not there yet, but um, yeah, I used to speak in hundreds and now I talk in thousands and I want to talk in hundreds of thousands and I want to talk in millions. So um, yeah, that's that's my philosophy and my take on, you know, um, retirement early, um, you know, I think that's just a word that people want to use. <laughs> um, you know, I want to spend time with my family now, not when I'm 60. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think to some of these people, it's not that you want to retire early, it's that you lack purpose. So once you find your purpose, then you won't necessarily want to retire early because like you said you can work until your 70s even 80s if it's something that you actually enjoy it's coming from a, a place that you don't so maybe you won't even need need to work by then but you will want to work you will want to do something productive and of course you will have more time freedom to be with your family you will, you will have some freedom to travel a little bit but always having something to strive for because what's the fun of being 50 and then you put on the pajamas and you don't do anything just watch tv like that's not a life at least not for us no exactly right and yeah like i love what donna white says he's like i live the best life in the world i get up every morning and i'm stoked to be alive i enjoy what i do and i don't want to go to bed at night you know like that's you know he he's got you know, billions, billion dollar businesses and he's probably got millions and millions of dollars. He never, he, he would, he could sit in his pajamas and drink cocktails on the beach for the rest, for, for, for 10 lifetimes, you know, but he gets up and he loves building businesses and he loves building brands. And why? Because it's the most fucking fun thing to do in the world. You know, you're alive, you know, and like I love working with Andy and JC and even like Dan West when I was speaking to him on the phone today. Like the internet's amazing. Like I'm speaking to you like um, halfway across the world. So um, yeah, like I love this game. It's the same in sport. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> you've got to you, – you have to step onto the court and risk to lose to get the win. So, yeah, dude, it's yeah, one, of those, one of those things. The game of you... business is fucking awesome. Yeah, dude, it's so much fun. It's the, mo it's, it's the most fun that I've had in a long time, you know? So, um, yeah, I can't. Yeah, man, it, it's the most fun that I've, I've had and um, I'm addicted to working on it. And, yeah, like for me, it's pretty hard work. Like I got a full-time job and... Um, I've got two businesses and I sold half of my amp or I gave half of Amplifier to my right hand man to run um, while we're building this SaaS product and um, that's taken up a fair chunk of of my time but you know it's it's been fun dude so um, no regrets and yeah I've learned how to outsource and delegate and yeah, we're still getting inbound clients through Amplify, which is great. And um, yeah, it's 
time to work on a new project and we've been working behind the scenes for the last two, three months and yeah, we look to go live next week. So yeah, we're really excited. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, yeah, um, the process was um, we created a very cool team. Um, one guy's a very experienced developer and I love my organic marketing and my close friend, JC, um, he's, he's amazing. He's got great connections. He's really good at newsletters and um, he's done amazing job with all the contracts and he's done, you know, a shit ton of work with a website and everything behind the scenes. And yeah, we, we saw an opportunity. I'll give you an example. I went from zero to a thousand followers in eight months on X. I went from a zero to a thousand in LinkedIn in 60 odd days. And, um, the way that their algorithm works and their um, plugins. Um, I, we, we had a couple of ideas and they failed. They didn't work. And then I found, I found that it's the same as X. The more you engage on LinkedIn, the more likes you get, the more followers you get, the more connections you get. Um, and they actually have a really good SEO search engine. Their hashtags are amazing. But they don't have lists. And amazing, the most amazing thing on X is lists and communities. So we're going to collaborate the lists and the communities and then have some add some AI layers into there for um, responses, comments, DMs, and... Yeah, like I think we can create a full stack business around, you know, automating, um, scheduling content and liking, commenting, responding um, and putting that into a full CRM. And I don't think anyone does it really well. A lot of the automation processes, are they just go mad and spit out the same AI rubbish over and over again. So yeah, we wanted to have some control over that and actually have some direction in in the lists and the community. So you know, if I'm looking for ghostwriting clients, you know, I can type in founders or I can type in CEO or I can type in agencies and it uses the keyword searches and then I can go through the profiles and click like, comment, like, comment and it trains how you like to comment and respond because it's giving you lots of options and it's refining. Okay, I like to reply in this way. Short comments, long comments, questions, insightfulness, um, funny. Um, and yeah, like we've been testing it and using it and we've just been going bananas on LinkedIn. So um, yeah, we know it works and um yeah, there's, you know, over a billion users on LinkedIn and not many posts every day. Um, but a lot of X crew are coming over to LinkedIn and yeah, we're excited for it to launch probably next next couple of weeks. But yeah, we're yeah, it's been a roller coaster, but yeah, we're excited for it, dude. Yeah, yeah, well we're just starting to post this week and that's part of my role. Um yeah, it's called Zapping and yeah, we're uh yeah, ready to go, and yeah, we'll we'll expand to X as well eventually. But we're just doing LinkedIn for now, and we'll see how that goes. There are lots of people interested, so yeah, man, we'll have to get you on board since you've you know come and joined us on LinkedIn now. So we'll get you te- we'll get you testing it and using it, and see how you like it and what we can improve. And we want to add layers on and continue to grow and we've got an amazing team of developers behind the scenes dude so yeah we can pretty much make anything happen it's just a matter of coding and time and what they do with the algorithm moving forward dude so yeah we're, we're super excited yeah 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 if anything man getting on social media has 100 percent created an amazing network that i wouldn't have otherwise and i wouldn't be able to do amplify or zap in without it so 
create content and good things will happen, man. And that's it. Create content, engage, make friends, jump on calls, host podcasts, go on podcasts, go on spaces. Um, LinkedIn is banging at the moment. So, yeah, it's it's a place to be. And, um, yeah, we're sticking to it. and We're getting some good traction there. So, and you can just repurpose content there anyway. So it's not too hard to do both, man. So um, it's all good. No, nah, we use one. We use a program. That's part of part of Amplify. I have one client. And my laptop's off at the moment, but I'll show you off air one time. Um, I got one client who's on every platform, literally YouTube, Shorts, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. X, LinkedIn, and yeah, um, yeah, it's doable, dude. It's just having that video content, having the script, and then having you know screenshots, repurposing content, written content. Yeah, it just takes time and planning, and yeah, we batch batch content. You know, podcasts like this, you can clip up and you have content for months. You know, so yeah, dude, it's possible. We we'll have to get you set. We have we have to get you set up, dude. We'll get you clipping up these podcasts and repurposing your content, dude. Infinite content, just with the podcast, and that's worthwhile just doing that, man. You know, it's worthwhile just doing that. So, yeah, man, it's awesome. So good. So my why is to have a positive impact on like have a positive impact on people's lives, um, and that's you know stems from my partner, my daughter, my immediate family, my community, my friends, my network, um, if I can problem solve and um, have a positive influence on them, then everything else, um, you know, will will align with your why um, and those morals will, you know, stick true to that. So... Um, and what does success look like? Yeah, uh, this is a tricky one. We create what we determine as successful. But I think there's a lot of people who have a lot of money that are not, you know, are deemed to, to be successful but are not really. I think success comes around to having really good relationships and doing what you want whenever you want and working on the projects that you want to do. So that's freedom time freedom and uh, you might have a lot of money but you might work offshore three weeks and home for one and are earning half a million dollars a year and you might be miserable yeah you might be rich and have a shitload of money but you're away from your family for three quarters of the year and you come home for a week and get on the piss and yeah we see that a lot here in Australia but um, yeah I think the definition of success is you know, problem solving and having a positive influence on people's lives, making the decisions that you want and having really good relationships and doing it on your terms. 